Greetings, everyone. Since there doesn't seem to be anyone online and there's no one here in the classroom, which is the first for the semester, I'm going to assume that people will all be watching this lecture after the fact, but I will still give it to an empty room because I'm a dedicated person. Okay, so um, there's some reading. Please finish White Chapter 7. If you haven't already, that's the chapter that you've been working on for the past week. And the last reading for the semester, parts of Chapter 8 and parts of Chapter 11. You've looked at parts of these chapters before. This is the final reading for the semester. You um, Please do it. It will help uh, explain some of what we're going to be talking about. So today we're going to continue talking about igneous petrogenesis, specifically magma mixing and something called EFC, which is assimilation fractional crystallization. And then we talk about using the rare earth elements um, as a group um, and some of the special ways we can use them to say something about the conditions of petrogenesis as well as variations in mantle source composition. Um, and we'll look at this <clears throat> in what we call extended rare earth element space, meaning rare earth elements plus some additional things. Um, and then we're going to have an intro to the final topic, which is on radiogenic isotope geology. We'll be focusing on this uh, next week, but we've got a little bit of stuff today. So I'm just going to check the screen to make sure it's still displaying OK. Um, it is, so let's go on. OK, so as we are talking about last time, we talked about how we use trace element partitioning via um, uh, <laughs> phenocrysts and melt and uh, distribution coefficients to say something about petrogenesis. We looked at crystallization, we looked at melting, and we um, talked about distribution coefficients before that. I just kind of want to emphasize that when we look at an erupted igneous rock, we tend to have to kind of work backward. First, we have to assume there's been no alteration of the rock when it's been sitting on the surface, and there are tests that we can do for that, assuming that isn't the case. Then we have some compositions in a rock and the phases in the rock, and we try to pull back from that. What was the history of that rock? What were the processes of crystallization, the conditions of magma storage, the conditions of melting, and ultimately what was the mantle source of those rocks? And that's fairly straightforward for some places. But in, in many other cases, magnets that erupt on the surface are actually more complicated. They can be mixtures of multiple magmas, or the magma could have interacted with rock in the lithosphere and the shallower crust as they ascend to the surface. So I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about some of those complications. So these are two of the processes, as I just mentioned, that can occur. One of them is what we call contamination. Contamination is um, as it sounds, a rock incorporating components of a magma, incorporating components of either the wall rock of the magma chamber or something beneath the magma chamber, or even in some cases above the magma chamber. Sometimes it shows up as zealots, chunks of foreign rock that we can easily identify. But oftentimes the signature is much more cryptic. There's a process that we call assimilation, which is kind of like sucking the juices out of, of a snow cone, for instance, where you're releasing some chemical components from the solids into the magma. And we have ways of modeling this, and I'll show you that on the next slide. Another thing that could happen is mixing. So we can have a couple of magmas in the magma chamber. They could be really different composition, or they could be very similar in composition, in which case um, the signatures might be a little bit more cryptic. But oftentimes, we have to rely on mixing. And the mixing can be of magmas that form from different natural sources or at different conditions of temperature and pressure, different times, um, different percents of melting, different crystallization histories, et cetera, et cetera. This is an example of a really obvious mixed magma. This is what's called a banded pumice. This is a pumiceous material that was erupted from Mount Lassen during the 1915 eruption. You can see these layers. You can even see that in some of these darker layers there are light crystals, and some of these lighter layer, layers there are dark crystals. These were two relatively cool and viscous magmas that as they mixed, they didn't stir completely. So we see it preserved in the rock, what the record of the two compositional end members are. That's oftentimes not as straightforward to see in hand specimen as in this case. I'm going to talk about mixing next week when we talk about uh, radiogenic isotopes, because it's something that's 
easier to disentangle with that. But I want to mention contamination for a moment now on the next slide. So this is a diagram of a process called AFC, Assimilation Fractional Crystallization. It comes from your textbook. And in essence, the way we, we like to think about the process of assimilation is that it's happening concurrently with the differentiation of a magma. And in fact, if one assimilates a certain amount of material out of the wall rock in the form of a melt or a fluid, that will cool the existing magma and cause some increment of differentiation of the magma. So these things happen together. We have to conserve heat. So this is just another equation. And you know, in the in the previous two lectures, I've been using L for liquid. Uh, which is the more common notation, but white uses M sometimes, it stands for melt. It's, uh, and otherwise, this is basically the concentration of a liquid at any point in time along an AFC pathway relative to the initial concentration. And then there's uh, an equation here. And this equation looks similar to um, the equation that we have for um, uh, fractional crystallization. The difference is, is that instead of having a distribution coefficient up here, we have um, something called Z. And what Z is, is a combined term that has both the distribution coefficient of the crystallizing phases and R. And R itself is the ratio of the material that is assimilated relative to crystallized. So for instance, if, if by mass, we take an equal proportion of stuff out of the wall rock and an equal proportion crystallizes, and that ratio would be one, okay? <clears throat> and the, uh, which would then cause this thing to essentially relax to something close to the distribution coefficient. But another component that's in this equation that's really important is this thing called CA, which is the concentration of the chemical in the assimilated material, right? Which is oftentimes very different than the material of the magma. And especially for uh, some, incompatible elements that could be highly concentrated in country rock so that when we assimilate a relatively small fraction, we can make a big signature. So this is a diagram of how this evolves. It's just like all the other diagrams we've been talking about for the past uh, couple of lectures. Here's we start with 100% magma and then we go down to having 0% magma. So there's crystallization going on. The difference is that the crystallization is accompanied by assimilation. So these are uh, pathways in red are what the pathways would look like for simple fractional crystallization, as it says here. And what these black lines are, are for fractional crystallization in the presence of assimilation. And there's some various things that need to be assumed to make this plot, such as what are the distribution coefficients and what are the concentrations of the elements in the original liquid. And so what you see here is evolution curves that you know, start out at very large amounts of magma and low amounts of fractionation and assimilation that look pretty similar to the red lines. But as we evolve further along having less and less liquid and more and more assimilant, then these curves can really start to deviate. And of course, we could dial these ratios however we want. This is a modeling exercise. And if we change the concentration of the element in assimilant a lot, or we um, change the relative proportion of assimilated material to um, crystallized material, then these trajectories can change. And so this is something that's used to model um, compositional attributes. And again, radiogenic isotopes, which we'll talk about next time, are helpful in this process because certain of the phenomena that happen during the making of igneous rocks don't fractionate the different isotopes in an isotope ratio. And so we can sort of separate out heterogenetic effects from things like the composition of the assimilant. We'll get to that next time. I just wanted to introduce this level of complexity to you. So for um, a while now, for the, um, maybe the next 15, 20 minutes, I want to switch gears and talk about how we use the rare elements as a group to um, study igneous processes. I just want to remind you of a couple things. These are the rare elements, again, lanthanum to lutetium, I pointed out where they sit on the tariff chart multiple times. There is a size variation when we go through this group, where, whereby when we go from light elements to heavy elements, there's something called a lanthanide contraction. The elements get smaller and smaller and smaller. This is an effect due to the mass and charge in the nuclei and the shielding of all the orbitals that are being filled as we go across the group, which causes a contraction in the orbital valence shell. 
And there are two elements along here that can change oxidation state relative to the common oxidation state, which is plus three. So at plus three, remember we talked about how size and charge and electronegativity are the three things that govern distribution. The electronegativity is pretty much the same across the group, the cell variation, but not much different. The charge is the same, except for these two special cases, and only the size varies. So this is one of the reasons why we use them, because they're pretty simple. Now, you're all familiar, we've talked about this several times before, it is commonly found in the plus two form instead of the plus three form. And when it's plus two, is a bigger ion, right? So it jumps up in size. Cerium, in very oxidizing conditions, it's not as common in igneous systems, it's common in um, hydrologic systems, for instance, but occasionally we can find cerium where it's been oxidized from the plus three to the plus four form. It gets a lot smaller, the ion contracts, and so it behaves differently. And so we're always, when we're looking at rare element patterns, looking for anomalies in either europium and cerium, because they tell us something about the oxidation state of the magma and phases that could be involved in differentiation. We're not going to talk much about this, but in the next few slides, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. And, uh, and you'll see how this kind of is useful and how, how, how used. So this is a diagram of some distribution coefficients across the rare earth, right? And I've highlighted europium just so you can sort of see it for a bunch of different minerals. And remember, these are mineral liquid distribution coefficients. So I've also highlighted the number one, which is um, anything above one would be compatible and anything below one would be incompatible. First thing to note, is that except for apatite, which is a phosphatic mineral that's found as an accessory phase in some, some magmas, especially more differentiated magmas, we're not going to talk about it much today, except for that, and except for garnet as the very heaviest rare earth, uh, the rare earth elements are incompatible in the typical basaltic mineral. It's really incompatible in all of them, right? Like less than a percent of pretty much all of the elements will go into olivine, the rest of it will be in the liquid. That's why it's got such a low value. Now, some of these other minerals have more variations. We go from big to small across the rare earth system. For instance, look at orthopyroxene, right? So it is, in a relative sense, the mineral is relatively depleted in the light rare earth and relatively enriched in the heavy rare earth. The mineral of garnet does the same thing, except it's got this greater distinction or uh, it favors the heavier rare earths. So it provides more leverage on magnets. When we pull garnet out, we expect to change the ratio of lanthanum to lutetium or lanthanum to ytterbium in the coexisting magma, more so if garnet were fractionating versus orthopyroxene. However, if we were to look at something like the lanthanum to samarium ratio, samarium being sort of a middle rare, these two things are indistinguishable. So sometimes you'll see geochemists say, oh, I'm comparing the lanthanum samarium ratio to lanthanum lutetium or lanthanum ytterbium ratio. And the reason for that is to try and disentangle effects like, is it garnet or is it OPX? Um, you can also see how hornblende um, and clinopyroxene have, have very similar you know, all of these things have ranges. These are sort of um, averages, but where they're sort of flat from the middles to the heavies, there's a little bit of action in the light rare earths. Overall, the rare earths like to go into CPX and amphiboles, something like 10 times as much as all of these, but they're still incompatible in the light rare earths and close to compatible in heavy rare earths. And then finally, we have feldspars. And what we see here is that there isn't much variation across the entire um, you know, group of rares except at europium. Europium has an anomaly. The reason europium has an anomaly is because it's in the plus two form. And in the plus two form, um, if you go back to this previous slide, you see the size is bigger and it's better accommodated into that mineral. So relative to um, the, the size is bigger and the charge is lower, I should say, together, right? So it's got the right charge to substitute for calcium and it's got a good size for the whole um, in the mineral, you go back and look at the Anuma diagram we talked about last time, to convince yourself of that. And, um, and so this makes it relatively more compatible. It's still incompatible, but less so. So we might say it's less incompatible. It's still below one, but a lot less. And so if you imagine a magma where we're crystallizing feldspar out of it, and we crystallize a lot out of it, 
the feldspar is going to have a positive europium anomaly. It's just going to leave the magma with a negative europium anomaly. It's going to be like extra um, europium taken out of the magma. And this, just like strontium, which we talked about the time before last, um, changing in what value it takes as a function of the composition of the plagioclase, same with europium. So if it happens to be you know, a very calcium-rich plagioclase, we're going to get a different amount of partitioning of an europium anomaly than if it's a, um, a low calcium plagioclase. So just to kind of summarize the things that we look at, and I also just want to emphasize that we abbreviate the rare earth elements as REE. You see this all the time in geochemical literature. Other terms that people use are things like HREE and LREE. That just means the heavy rare earths and the light rare earths. Sometimes people will also distinguish what we call the MREE, which is the middle rare earths, which are basically samarium through dysprosium. Another thing which I pointed out last time that I also want to remind um, you of it is that promethium doesn't have any non-radioactive naturally permanent isotopes on Earth. So sometimes people leave it out of their diagrams. Sometimes people put it in there um, and they basically interpolate a value from the things on either side. But there's no promethium data that people uh, collect. So it's not to be collected. So um, this just kind of emphasizes what I just said, right? That all the rare earths are incompatible in all of these phases to varying extents, except apatite and the heavy rare earths in garnet. So you can imagine if you have a system that is fractionating apatite, it could cause there to be very low concentrations in um, the rare earth elements in the coexisting magma. There are other things we look at with it for apatite to show that that is happening. It has impacts on the halogens. It has impacts on storm and uranium. It has impacts on phosphorus concentration. Um, there are some other trace mineral phases that are not listed on here, things like uh, zircon, um, which is zirconium silicate, and sphene, um, which is uh, now known by the term titanite. Some these phases, which can also be found as accessory phases in some silicic systems, can also have impacts on the rare earth elements. But I'm just sticking with those kind of simpler phases just uh, to uh, make this discussion a little bit more simple. So this brings up the idea of what's called a europium anomaly. When you look in books, textbooks, and the literature, you'll sometimes see europium with a little star. And that is basically how different is europium relative to what we would expect if it was partitioning as a plus three ion. So in essence, what it is is a way of saying how big is this divot or spike It'll be a spike if we're looking at the mineral, it'll be a divot if we're looking at the coexisting magma. In some cases, it'll be small, in some cases, it'll be big. And what we're doing is we're comparing to the things on either side and taking an average, which would basically be if it were a plus three ion, it would be somewhere um, following along this smooth line. And um, we're looking at the kind of relative difference relative to that as a fraction, right? So these things are usually given as. Um, uh, you know, that you can think of them as percents, but they're usually given as fractions. Like a 0.9 would be that there's a depletion of europium, about 10% downward depletion. If it was a 1.1, that would mean there was an enrichment of europium of about 10%. And so the way it's calculated mathematically is using an arithmetic union, where we're basically taking the amount of europium that's measured and we're dividing it by the, the sort of multiple of the square roots of the amount of samarium and the amount of gadolinium, which are the two elements on either side, right? And so basically, this is the arithmetic mean of, Euro of what europium would be, assuming it's smoothly connected to the elements on either side, and this is what's actually measured. And so positive values obviously mean there's extra europium in the magma, um, and negative values, or, or excuse me, I should say values less than one mean that there's uh, less europium. And we actually see europium anomalies correlate with stuff like calcium concentration or calcium aluminum ratio, things that are sensitive to plagioclase fraction. So we're going to look at that uh, at the rare earths now um, in a series of kind of um, scenarios and experiments that help us understand how they differentiate um, and partition during uh, kind of melting and crystallization. Um, as a function of the different kinds of conditions that this would happen. So here's again a diagram of the rare elements. 
And here is the rare element concentration normalized to Congress. That's what that little CH means in this particular notation. And we've seen that before. We know what the chondritic normalization is. The rare earth elements as a group are highly refractory. They condensed with the earliest materials of Earth and they didn't go into the core. They didn't go into the atmosphere. So the primitive mantle basically, um, we believe, follows very closely with that pyrolite model of basically devolatilizing and removing iron from about 90% of the chondritic mantle. And we get, in essence, chondritic ratios of all the rare earth elements in the primitive mantle. The concentration is a little bit different, but the ratios of them are the same. So now if we take that stuff and we decide to melt it, right, we can do various things by the process of melting. And I'll focus on that on this slide, and then next we'll talk about um, crystallization. So let's start with a peridotite, a sort of a garden variety mantle lithology that is fertile, uh, meaning it hasn't been melted before, and it um, is, um, you know, has chondritic uh, ratios of the rare elements. And so this is what it would look like on this diagram. It's highlighted here the green line. Concentration, some people would say it's about two, other people would say it's two and a half, other people would say it was three of chondrites. Um, but, but in any event, the reason this is a flat line is because the ratio of each of those elements or the relative proportions that they exist in are the same chondrite. Okay. Now, if we take that stuff and we melt it without garnet, okay, and we melt it a lot, meaning 50%, which is a hugely unrealistic amount of melting for the mantle. But if we do that, you will generate a new a magma that has, a, in essence, another flat line, but double the concentration, right? Because we've excluded half of the mass by melting 50%. If you melt less, like in this case, let's melt 20%, then you get higher concentrations of everything, right? Which there, these are all incompatible elements. They're all going into the melt. And we've got less mass involved, so the concentration is going to be higher. But we also start to see this increase in concentration in the light rare earth elements. We call that light rare earth element enriched. And this slight enrichment in this model calculation is coming entirely from the process of making magma. It is not an inherent um, compositional attribute of the mantle. We can have that as well, but in this numeric experiment, we're starting out with chondritic values. Now, if we melt even less, like melt 10%, which is this top line, okay, you can see the concentrations are higher and the light earth element enrichment is also more pronounced. And now notice that I've written there in brown without garnet. So this is melting in the mantle, shallower than about 100 kilometers where garnet is not present, right? And so this phase, which I've highlighted in this particular diagram in orange, isn't present. And what we're really looking at is the way the rare earth partition as a function of um, primarily the pyroxenes, olivine, and uh, those are the phases that they're going to have the most control. And um, they, are, they don't end up playing a, a huge role from the proportions that they are present and the large amount of melting. But they can do a little bit of light rare earth element enrichment, which corresponds with this light rare earth element depletion in the coexisting minerals, okay? Now, if we add in garnet, which has that very strong uh, capability to differentiate or to partition, I should say, the heavy rare earth elements, you'll see that where we start to see a big difference when we melt in the presence of garnet is in the heavy rare earth elements. See how it's got such a steep line. So we have questions like, how deep does melting initiate underneath Kauai? Or how deep does it initiate under um, Yellowstone? Or you know, name, name your place. Uh, how deep does it initiate under a mid-ocean ridge? And in places where the magnetism initiates very, very deeply, we tend to see these garnet signatures. Okay? And garnet can show up in, in other elements besides the rare earths. But because the rare earths behave so cohesively as a group, they're oftentimes the sort of first go-to the thing that people will look at to try and, for instance, distinguish whether or not garnet has been present. And once the sort of you know melting has been modeled, to also look at the possibility of some of these funny accessory phases that can also partition things in unusual ways, uh, some of the rest of them. So um, this slide just kind of summarizes some of the stuff about you know what I just said about, for instance, um, why the rare element as a group we think have relative abundances that are chondritic 
absolute abundances are something like two and a half to three times the chondritic value. That's because we make uh, our chondritic bulk primitive mantle out of chondrites that we've removed the iron from and the mass of the core. It's about a third of the mass of the earth, which ends up holding up the concentration of uh, everything that didn't go into the core by, by this factor. So, so um, you will oftentimes see things normalized to chondrites. So here's a couple of places where historically where the rarest have been really important. One of them, I mentioned these before when we talked about the moon forming event, that it's got these the Mare basalts, which were forming, you know, relatively early on in the history of the moon um, and ceased just soon after heavy bombardment ceased. And then in addition, we have these lunar highlands, which are um, a North acidic rocks. These are gabbros. They're very rich in anorthite, as well as typically ferroxene and um, oxide minerals. And when we look at these two rocks together, we look at the abundances of the rare elements. Again, normalized to chondrites. Okay, we see the mare basalts have really high values, like up to 100, which implies, since they're very, very concentrated relative to chondrites, implies a very, either a very small degree of melting to increase their concentrations that much, and or a bulk mantle of composition on the moon, which is much higher in concentration than the bulk mantle on Earth. Since we, for various other reasons, we think that the Mare, excuse me, the moon, you know, was formed from material primarily ejected from the Earth, there's really no reason to assume that the lunar forming event somehow really increased the rare element abundance. So instead, we think that this has more to do with the amount of melting that happened when that was formed. But the other thing that is so interesting is to see that the magma compositions of these two things look like mirror images of each other, right? And so we kind of understand that the magma may have formed by melting in, in this you know, early lunar mantle, producing some concentration of rare elements and everything else. And then we started to crystallize out large quantities of this gabbroic material, which under some conditions can float. It can be less dense than the magma it comes from, that's what's thought to have happened in the formation of these lunar highlands, which are made out of a north site. So these things kind of floated like icebergs and they stick up. And part of these very high concentrations there are due to the fact that a lot of the mass of the liquid was taken out after melting by a crystallization, right? And so that's what helps to increase these concentrations so high. And you can make calculations about how much, you know, what under what conditions was it batch crystallization? Was it really crystallization? And, and people have made these calculations um, and they are realistic scenarios that, that can explain them. So the next thing I wanna look at is specifically the role of crystallization um, and the making of europium anomalies. Um, and so I've got a couple of examples of rocks here. And um, these are the rare elements again. They're, they're, instead of their names being given, you're just seeing the atomic number there. And this is again the rare element concentration in the rock normalized to chondrites. And you see two things on this diagram. You'll see mid ocean ridge basalts, which sit in a range, right, of concentrations somewhere between, I don't know, five ish to 10 ish at the light end and, you know, something like twice as much at the heavy end. And they are all slightly lighter element depleted. We talked about the Borb mantle previously when we talked about the formation of the crust and the earth. And I did a calculation for potassium. And we showed that the depleted mantle in the upper part of the mantle from which crust has been previously extracted is depleted in highly incompatible elements. And we see that effect here in mid ocean rich basalts. The, Amount of melting that goes on in mid ocean rich basalts and the conditions of melting generally shallower than the garnet stability field mean that we don't get a lot of fractionation of the rare earths during the melting. And instead, this light rare earth element depletion is a characteristic of the mantle source. The fact that the more mantle has been melted once before to make the crust causes this depletion, which then just gets reported by more. Now, this thing here said BCR1. BCR1 is kind of a famous rock because it's one of the early rock standards that many geochemists use. It was widely uh, collected and homogenized and distributed to many people. It stands for Basalt Columbia River. So this is from the Columbia River flood basalt, which is one of the youngest flood basalt provinces on Earth. It exists in Oregon. 
And um, some people have linked the flood basalt province to an earlier phase of the plume that's now feeding a Yellowstone volcano. In any event, the thing about BCR is it's unlike more, it's, it's light rare earth element and rich. You can see the heavy rare earth element concentration is about the same, but there's a big difference. And this light rare earth element enrichment can come from multiple things. It can come from the enriched mantle source. It can come from the conditions of melting and differentiation, you know, in a relative sense. It might not be that these are enriched. It might be that these are relatively depleted because of melting in the presence of garnet. Um, and it can come from wall rock contamination, as we just talked about at the beginning today. So there are, there are multiple ways that this could be formed, and we would have to investigate using other elements and some isotope ratios to sort of disentangle them. But the reason that it's on here is to show you what is the effect of taking a BCR-like composition and fractionating out a bunch of plagioclase. I mean, we've got a BCR magma sitting in the, um, in the crust and it's producing plagioclase crystals. If you take out 40% of the mass and make plagioclase, you get this small little anomaly, right? So you can see that the concentrations of everything go up because the mass of the magma is now lesser and the incompatible elements simply increase in concentration. But because europium is pulled out with the plagioclase, we make a small little anomaly. It isn't much of, anom of an anomaly, right? And yet we required a huge amount of plagioclase to, to make it. So it's kind of important to, to recognize that europium anomalies that are made by fractionation of crystals are not generally that big. They're generally less than 10%. And if we see a huge europium anomaly, like a 20 or 25%, unless there's other indicators in the magma that tell us that, oh yeah, we had totally extreme amount of plagioclase fractionation, then that anomaly may have come from somewhere else, meaning it could have been uh, inherited as part of the magma composition before crystallization, or could have come from assimilation, or some combination of processes. Okay, so um, the next thing to think about is the, the relative shapes of these curves, the so-called enrichment and depletion, the names that I mentioned previously, LREE -E, stands for light rare earth element depletion. This is the general pattern of light rare earth element depletion and enrichment, which I kind of just uh, talked through on the last slide, so I'm not going to repeat it. Um, the next thing I want to do is talk about now what kinds of patterns do we see typically in basaltic magmas at different tectonic sets? Right, so you can make basalts at mid ocean ridges, you can make them at island arcs, you can make them in places like here, like Hawaii, which is called OID, ocean island basalt. Um, you can make um, hot spot related basalts at continental uh, flood basalts. And um, so, the, and so in this diagram, those things are compared. And this is highly schematic, you know, so this first thing I would say, but what you tend to find is the least variation in island arc magmas, okay? Somewhat greater variation in mid-ocean rich basalts, and the biggest variations in things that come off of mantle plumes, whether they're continental, or oceanic settings isn't as critical. These two things are pretty similar. So we already know why mid-ocean rich basalts are light rare earth element depleted. That's because the more absorbed mantle has had something extracted from it before, which preferentially pulled out the light rare earth elements. You might say, well, uh, uh, island arc basalts come from subduction of mid-ocean rich basalts it's going down on an old piece of lithosphere. And in part, that's true, they do, but the vast majority of the material that melts to make of the salt and island arc comes from what we call the mantle wedge. It stops sitting above the subducting plate. And that stuff, um, for kind of a variety of reasons, mostly that it's been processed multiple times before and the mantle ends up being you know, relatively depleted and then has some stuff added back to it from the subducting slab in the process of melting, uh, it tends to show less variation. Now we're going to look at some actual data from island arc basalts and we'll see that there's actually quite a, a range. So this, this is a simplification, but um, what it really should show is something more like in island arc basalts, we can find things that look kind of like more and things that kind of look light earth element enriched and everything in between. And the light earth element enrichment here 
can again come from two things. It can either come from melting from a chondritic mantle in the presence of garnet. And just go back to this experiment uh, that's plotted here to remind you of that. that you can get a steep rare element profile if you melt something with um, chondritic composition in the presence of garnet. Um, or it can come from the fact that rather than it being chondritic mantle, that mantle has actually been what we call enriched, meaning stuff has been added to it. We're going to focus on that process next week when we talk about um, radiogenic isotopes because they're particularly useful for this. But if you think about it in the context of plate tectonics, we're taking stuff and sticking it back into the mantle, including some sediments and some altered oceanic crust. And that material, if it doesn't get extracted, at island arcs and it manages to move, go back down into the mantle and stir in can actually cause concentrations that are above chondritic because we're putting stuff back into the mantle. And so there, there's a combination of processes that result in this kind of light earth element enrichment in um, hot spot related magmas. Now we want to oversimplify it. And again, we can find some, uh, differences in the amount of steepness of this enrichment. But the fact that it varies in these two examples relatively smoothly, instead of going kind of flat to the middle and then turning heavy, is kind of an indication it's probably primarily not a garnet signature. It could be a garnet signature superimposed, but um, it's probably a mantle lithology signature. Okay, so here are some, some data. This is again from the book. These are um, some characteristic patterns of Rare elements again normalized to chondrite. Okay, for the red lines are mid-ocean rich basalts. Okay, so you can see there's a variety of concentrations here that could have to do with the relative amount of melting that happened in each one of these cases, but they all share this light earth element depletion, right? So these lines are just sort of like shifted up and down. Can you also see the Europium anomaly, which I pointed out here? See how it's it the Europium anomaly gets bigger and bigger as the concentrations get higher and higher. That is telling us that in this case, for the lowest concentrations with no europium and all, that's primarily a signature of melting where there isn't any plagiocase place and there's no phase that can help make the europium anomaly. Once that magma percolates up into the crust and sits and differentiates before eruptions, plagiocase place is a common mineral that can be taken out. And so as concentrations increase of all the rare earth elements, we start to build in this europium anomaly in mid ocean ridge basalts. Um, and we see that if you were to make a plot of the size of the europium anomaly relative to the absolute concentrations of the rare earth as measured by the lutetium, you would see that as the concentration of lutetium goes up, the europium anomaly uh, increases in size. And that's due to the removal of budget. Now focus your eye on the black dots. Uh, there's open and closed symbols. They're from different hotspots. These are all oceanic hotspots. Most of those are in the Pacific. Uh, St. Helena and Tristan um, are in the Atlantic Ocean. Actually, they're not mostly in the Pacific. I had to note that one. The Azores, St. Helena, and Tristan are in the Atlantic. La Union is uh, in the Indian Ocean. Uh, but what you see is a pretty common set of patterns. They're steep, right? And they, they kind of fan out up here, but they're all light, rare earth element enriched. And um, again, this is related to a combination of mantle source lithology as well as some melting in the presence of um, garnet. The other thing to you know kind of note is the great distinction in concentration in the light rare earth elements, right? So these uh, hot spot related magnets have really high concentrations, factors of you know 10 to almost 100 greater than more. But if we come to the heavy rare earth elements, in some cases, more have more than the um, uh, hotspot magnets. And that is probably related to, to um, at least to some extent, the role of garnet, because we're actually pulling this concentration down somehow um, below more concentrations to the heavy rows. These are just some more patterns. So these are for arc magmas. Okay. And so again, this is, um, these are arcs in the Western Pacific, Northern Pacific, Sunda Arc is one of the components of Indonesia. The Antilles is in the Caribbean, uh, both, both of these in the Caribbean, and the New Britain Arc is again in the Western, um, Western Pacific. 
And so what we see here, it looks a little bit different than this simplified diagram here, which says, oh, they're flat. They're not exactly flat. Um, but what we tend to see is a fair amount of variation. There are some arcs that are pretty flat, right? But, um, and, and yet there could be examples of some rocks that have light earth element enrichments um, to varying extents, varying extents of European anomaly. Again, mostly the conditions of differentiation. Some of them have what we call a spoon shaped profile, like these, where it actually dips down in the middle of rare earth and comes back up. That's usually a signature of amphibole, at least that's how it's commonly interpreted. Um, and um, I guess you know the other the, the other thing I would say is is that um, we don't see any light earth element depletion patterns here, right? They're either flat or slightly enriched. So whatever's going on, and again, you know, arcs are complicated mixes of what's in the mineral wedge, what's being subducted, what is being pulled off the subducted slab and added back into magnets to produce their complicated compositions. Through that whole process, we don't end up getting anything that really looks like more. Right, it's either flat or it's a light earth element. Now, if we want to say more about magma compositions, we um, then we can tell with the rare earth. We sometimes go to include some other elements that behave slightly differently. Um, the rare earth elements as a group are super useful, but sometimes it's useful to throw in some other elements. And so these are what are called extended rare earth element diagrams. Some people have used a term called spidergram. It's like one of my like hot button, I hate it words. Uh, you know, um, I don't like when people use it because it doesn't really mean anything to me. Uh, but in any event, if you hear someone say that, this is what they're talking about. What it really is, and I've highlighted the rare earths in yellow and then some other elements in blue and green. Mostly in an extended rare earth element diagram, we're adding in elements that are more incompatible than, than the most incompatible rare earth, which is for the most part lanthanum. And we have two categories of elements. I've mentioned these categories before. We have these very big low charge elements, which we call large ion lithophile, barium, rubidium, potassium. Okay. We also have these things called high field strength elements. These are small ions with a lot of charge, thorium, niobium, tantalum. And in both these cases, these things are more incompatible, usually. This order can be a little bit arbitrary, but people over time have started to agree on what order they're going to put the elements in so that we can compare patterns in different papers. Uh, but you will also see that there are a couple of these high field strength elements, zirconium and hafnium, um, which are plotted in the middle of the diagram because they their incompatibility is somewhere like a middle rare element. Right? And so the whole point of ordering these things in a certain way is to try and look for smooth patterns that would be related to incompatibility or compatibility of one kind or another. And um, you can also see uh, yttrium. It's a plus three ion. It's, it's over here right next to strontium. It's, it's moderately incompatible. It acts kind of like a heavy rare earth. It's a lot easier to measure than the rare earth elements. So especially in the early days, people would measure yttrium a lot. Um, as, as is zirconium is a relatively easy thing to measure by some methods. Um, actually, niobium is now pretty easy to measure too. Um, you can see where the element titanium sits, the element phosphorus. These are both considered minor elements in, in the rocks. Um, so we get those measurements as well. And where strontium sits. And uh, it's not nearly as incompatible as these guys, right? These are all plus one ions. This is a plus two ion, which, and, uh, and so it's, it's a lot smaller. These are just two different diagrams that have slightly different orderings of the elements. Um, but the main things that, that I want to point out is, is that if you just focus on the yellow areas, you would see what a rare earth element profile looks like, kind of like of the ones we were looking at here. And those, uh, those, so those other elements are mostly sticking off the side and or interspersed in the middle. And um, so oftentimes people will compare what these diagrams look like to just a rare earth element diagram. So again, if we look at mid-ocean rich basalts, we'll see the same thing that we saw on the previous diagrams, which are light rare element depletion. And some of these other elements that are thrown in, like zirconium and hafnium, yeah, they pretty much just follow that trend. But when we go to these really incompatible elements, these high field strength and these large ion lithophiles, they really show an enhanced depletion. And that's because these are super incompatible elements and they are ultra depleted in the depleted mantle 
before melting takes place because of this prior crustal destruction. Now, interestingly enough, if we look at ocean island basalts, they have uh, the light rare earth elements enriched, as we talked about a couple slides back, and this continues into these high field strength elements. But then when we get into these large island lithophile, it turns around again. Okay. And that can, again, be related to compositional complexity in the mantle and or the processes of magmatism. And this you know, can be more or less extreme depending on kind of, these are just two different compilations that come out of, out of a textbook. And some of these aspects of these patterns are the same, some are a little bit different. But um, so again, we can oftentimes differentiate or distinguish different hot spots and different plumes from the relative amount of light layer element enrichment and high and uh, highly incompatible element relative depletion. And finally, we've got uh, island arc basalts. And so what we see is that of all of the three types of patterns, the island arc basalts are the most jagged, right? Whereas if you go back here, it's like, yeah, they're pretty smooth, right? We got our europium and all, but otherwise they might be flat or they might be sloped, but they're smooth. Right, but when we look at the island arc basalts on this diagram, we see some other big anomalies, right? And where the anomalies occur are at the green elements, the high field strength elements. And the reason for this is thought to be due to the fact that the melting regime where island arc magnets are made is more oxidized. More oxidized because you've got water coming in off this conducting slab. That oxidation helps to stabilize minerals into which the high field strength elements are compatible, okay? For instance, spinel. And so because they're compatible, they get held back when you make the magma and you get these really strong depletion fields. And again, these are uh, like kind of gross simplifications of what you find in, in various places, but it is unlike if you just compare the rare element parts of these diagrams, if you start to throw in these other elements, you can really start to see how different chemicals are used to help understand different parts of the magma forming process in these different settings. Especially the high field strength elements are really useful at ARCs to understand things like how oxidize them. So um, this just kind of summarizes what I just said about the littles and the high field strength and the things that can make them change. Okay, so um, there's some other elements that we use sometimes in these cases that um, in addition to the way oxidation state and prior mantle depletion and or enrichment work, you can think about the solubility of an element in water. So for instance, the things like the high field strength elements, they are held back during the melting process in some island arc magmas because of oxidation. But there are other elements that because they're soluble in water, they get released from the subducting slab in fluids that flux into what we call metasomatize the mantle as part of the melting process. And so we can find them enriched in arc magnets. These are things like barium, which is very soluble in water, and uranium. Barium being a large ion lithophile. Uranium doesn't really fit in the category of large ion lithophile or high field strength. It's both big and highly charged. So it's incompatible, but it doesn't really fit in either of those ca categories. But because they're water soluble, magmas where we think have been formed where some fluid phase has been added in the mantle either before or during melting will show enrichment, big enrichments in barium thorium ratio. And um, you know sometimes this is plotted as uranium thorium ratio, sometimes it's plotted as thorium uranium ratio. But again, enrichments in the uranium relative to thorium. And so when we look at uh, the sort of arc magnets relative to ocean island basalts, we will find much higher bearing thorium ratios there and much lower thorium uranium ratios. And, um, and so this is again indicative of how much of that material is being added. As you can kind of now imagine from what we've been talking about, there um, is a lot of leverage from the trace element chemistry on magma compositions, but there's a lot of possibilities. There are very few unique answers. And this is because many of these systems are multi-phase, multi-stage, um, there can be mixtures, there can be assimilation, there's a lot of moving pieces. And so we can place some balance on things, but one of the things that, um, which is the sort of topic, the last topic for the semester, and we're gonna start on today, that helps us see through some of this, are to use things that um, are not affected by some of the processes. 
So one of the things that we do is use what we call radiogenic isotopes, and we'll define what those are. But these are, in essence, isotopes of chemical elements that were produced from some other chemical element they over time. So there's a time component to how we use these things. And there's a compositional component to these things because radiogenic isotopes that are what we call daughters are produced by parents. And if the parent has a different incompatibility to the daughter, we can change the ratio of parent to daughter isotope in a system as a function of um, the process that causes the fractionation. We look at things in terms of ratios instead of absolute abundances because if we compare something that was produced by radioactive decay to another isotope of that same element that was not produced by radioactive decay, it's just a stable element that was there all along, then that ratio is the same element, just two different isotopes, it's generally not fractionated um, at all during igneous processes. So instead, it will tell us which part of the chemistry came from what was melted instead of how it was melted or what crystallized instead of how it was crystallized. Because as I say, the trace element ratios are sensitive to both the radiogenic isotopes or not. So to kind of go into how we use these things, we have to remind ourselves of a couple of things. One is the radioactive decay equation, right? So for radioactive isotopes, and this is true whether it's something that's got a really short half-life or a really long half-life or anything in between. Remember, we talked about this when we talked about um, nucleus synthesis and the formation of the elements, but the number of a radioactive element over time, something that is decaying uranium, uranium-238, for instance, is going to equal however much was there at, uh, initially times you know, exponent minus lambda times t, t being the time, how long has it been, lambda being the decay constant. If you recall, the decay constant is the way we typically quantify radioactivity. Um, it's the amount of decays that you would measure off of a constant mass of material in a unit time. It's inversely proportional to the half-life. So a big half-life is something that's decaying really slowly. It has a really small lambda, okay? A short half-life, something that's decaying really fast, has a large lambda. So it can be used for radio radioactive dating. And we're not going to talk too much about dating here in the class. We'll, we'll talk about it a little bit, but um, in part because we need it to backtrack in time to find out initial compositions for the Earth. But when we're using it for dating, we're looking at the change of composition over time and relating variations we see in a system to changes associated with time. Okay, But we can also use it to think about how Earth reservoirs evolve in time. Right, so if, if we did something in the distant past, like let's say we the very first bit of crust that was subducted into the mantle, maybe that was three billion years ago, maybe it was four billion years ago, we don't really know when. If when that stuff went down and it had a certain composition that's been sitting down there for four billion years, it's had time for the radioactive isotopes in that material that were subducted to change and decay into their daughter products so that the daughter isotopic composition will be reflected by it. Was if we subduct something today, right? Stick it down there today. There's been no time for any radioactive ingrowth, so we're going to have a big difference between the daughter isotope and the parent isotope composition. So as I say, this equation is for the parent. We could write another equation, which is as a parent isotope decays from the amount that's there initially to the amount that's there present, it decays into something else. We call this something else a daughter isotope. So always with radioactivity, the parent isotope is going down over time. How fast it goes down over time is the function of the lambda. And the daughter isotope is going up. Now we can have some cases where the daughter isotope is also radioactive. So it gets produced and then it also decays. That, that's more complicated and we'll talk about that later. But for now, for some systems, you can just think about this as a lever, right? And so if we can compare for instance, rubidium-87 and strontium-87, rubidium being the parent, strontium being the daughter, if we just stick a piece of material and lock it away for a few billion years, and every billion years we check in on it, we're going to see that the rubidium-87 is going down and strontium-87 is going up, because that's where that's decay. Okay. So this is how decay looks when we incorporate the daughter, OK? So because we have to have conservation of mass, meaning we're not just going to create or destroy total nuclei, 
the total number of parent isotopes present at any given time, right? Um, and initially it's all in zero. Let's just say we have no daughter. And then let's say we wait some time and some parent has decayed. So we have less at that, this new time, time zero, some new time. And now we have some daughter, but the sum of these two things is gonna equal that, if that makes sense, right? Like if you have, start out with 10 isotopes and you wait some time and one of those uh, 10 elements of the parent one of them decays, you're going to have nine of these and one of these. And if you wait for most of it to decay, eventually you'll have zero of these and 10 of these. And you can have mixtures all, all in between. And so the ratio of the number of the parent to the daughter is going to tell us something about how long along that process we are. So we can substitute into um, you know, that simple equation up there, one, this, this simple decay equation, this relationship between parent and daughters that basically gives us another expression, which tells us that the daughter isotope quantity is going to be a function of how much N was there initially, how much time has evolved, and was there any daughter isotope to start off with initially, right? Like in that case of rubidium and strontium that I talked about, we can make some strontium-87 during nucleosynthesis. Not all of strontium-87 on Earth came from decay of rubidium-87. Some of it we already had initially. So what we're really wanting to quantify with radioactivity is the amount of added rubidium, excuse me, strontium-87. Uh, and so we have to subtract out the initial quantity. So th this, this is a sort of formal form of the decay equation, which says that the daughter at any given time in a system is going to be equal to how much daughter was there initially, this can be hard to, to estimate, but I'll show you the ways that we do it, plus the amount of daughter produced by radioactive decay. It's a sum. Now, oftentimes, rather than measure just the, you know, strontium-87 and the rubidium-87, we make the measurement as a ratio. And I'll talk a, a little bit more about this next week, but there's a couple of reasons for it. One is, is that when we make the measurements on a mass spectrometer, it's way easier to measure ratios than absolute abundances, and there's effects in the mass spectrometer that can separate elements a little bit. We call it fractionation as a part of their isotope ratio. So um, there are all, other reasons are that it's, it's kind of like doing a normalization, normalizing elements. So in this case, for strontium, for instance, we would just use another isotope that's not radioactive or radiogenic, being produced by reactive, and it would be 86. So this is why you see people talking about, oh, it's strontium 87, 86 ratio. That's basically the daughter isotope the parent isotope and a normalizing isotope, which is a stable isotope of the um, daughter element, but not the same isotope as, as the daughter itself. Okay, so, um, you know, basically there are two ways to use this equation. And sometimes you will see these things simplified, like this thing here, which is the daughter isotope normalized by a stable isotope of the same element. Sometimes I'll be written as R. It just means the radiogenic isotope ratio. It is the thing that's being produced. And this thing here will sometimes be denoted as P, which just means the parent. The rubidium 87 normalized to, in this case, strontium 86. Um, so we can um, use this to tell time. And I'm going to show you some examples of that in a second. Um, and we can also use it to look at the history of metal sources. Right, so if, as again, I've been sort of alluding to this fact, we've been having plate tectonics going on now for billions of years. We're subducting stuff into the mantle. We're pulling stuff back out of the mantle. The mantle is changing, right? It's evolving over time. And just by the very, you can have the exact same process happening today, a billion years ago, two billion years ago, three billion years ago. And we're gonna see different proportions of the daughter and the parent because of that time component. So this is one of the really important ways that we use isotopes it's one of the ways to say, how long do we think that the mantle is now melting underneath Hawaii? How long has it been down there? You know, it has subducted mantle components in it. Have they been down there for a half a billion years or a billion years? Are they a mixture? The mantles are kind of a dynamic place, but um, for the most part, in many hot spots, there's a couple of examples that, are, that have shorter time scales like Samoa, but we're thinking about hundreds of millions, maybe a half a billion years of residence in the mantle. Uh, before that stuff comes back back up in the form of these rocks. Okay, so 
a couple of things that I just kind of want to remind you about. We talked about igneous compositions reflect a whole slew of processes. What's the metal made of? How does it melt? How does it crystallize? What does it interact with along the way? We've also talked about the process of planetary differentiation, right? Like, okay, we start with a chondritic earth that gives us some assumptions for some of our elements. How did that happen? When did that happen? And um, how might that affect some of the isotopes and the isotope systems we use? Some of them are affected by that more than others. Some of the elements that we commonly use are refractory, so they're not so affected. Some of them go into the core a little bit, like lead, which is one of the common isotopes we use, is a little bit soluble in the core. Um, some of them are gaseous. So we have to think a little bit about how planetary scale differentiation may have separated some of the elements and isotopes in the initial materials of the Earth, because we pretty much end up comparing everything that we find back to initial primitive mantle. Just like we do for the rare earth elements and other things, where we're comparing things to chondrites, we also compare our isotope compositions back to the initial Earth. The problem is, is that for some elements, we can assume chondritic, and for some, we can't. And, and I'll show you a little bit of how we know that coming up. OK, so um, the two main things that can affect isotopic heterogeneity in uh, igneous rocks are planetary differentiation and ongoing magmatic activity. Okay, And some of the other things that it's not sensitive to are the effects of crystallization, the percent of melting, all that kind of stuff which can affect the trace elements. So that's kind of why we use them. So we use isotopes to kind of distinguish between ancient and um, recent processes that are uh, both overprinting in the trace elements. And, and they see through this uh, process of crystallization, not 100%, but kind of close. And this is just a slide to kind of remind you of the dynamics of the planet, right? We're making our mid-ocean rich basalts from depleted mantles, previously had crust extracted from it. That stuff is moving along the seabed at some kind of slow pace and tends to perhaps 100 million years later, it's subducting back into the mantle. Some of that is going back down into the mantle and re enriching it. Some of it's being sucked off into island arc volcanoes. And we also have hot spots, which are believed to generally sample deeper within the mantle domains that kind of reflect the superimposed effect of all these things going on. Okay, um, so um, I don't know why I put in this slide um, other than to say it just kind of reiterates what I keep talking about, which is that when we look at trace elements, which are relatively easy to measure and have a lot of leverage for some processes, they oftentimes give us non-unique answers. We come up, we say, oh, we see all this uh, trace element variability. A great example would be in the Honolulu series volcanic rocks, like the rocks that the lava flow sit on. They have really uh, crazy trace element compositions that would make you think if that was all uh, coming out of the mantle, if the mantle is making them is really unusual. However, if we measure radiogenic isotopes along with them that are insensitive to the process of melting, we actually find that, wow, the, most of these rocks that make up the Honolulu series, the you know Diamond Head, Cocoa Head, all that kind of stuff, have really depleted isotopic compositions. They don't even come out of the hot spot. They come out of the depleted upper mantle, and then it's really wild conditions of magmagenesis, meaning really small degrees of partial melting, which is causing the crazy trace element compositions. We can't tell that with the trace elements alone. We need some other thing that is insensitive to some of the processes to be able to pull that out. And we'll, we'll look at that in a little bit more detail coming up. So um, in radiogenic isotope systems, we oftentimes write this ratio R, as I've alluded to before, which is a radiogenic daughter, something being produced, to a non-radiogenic isotope of the same element. So in the case of strontium, we're talking about strontium-87 being our radiogenic daughter and um, strontium-86 being our um, non-radiogenic isotope. If you think about radiocarbon dating, which is used for different, different things, but we have the same kind of ratio. If you get a radiocarbon date, they don't just tell you the amount of carbon-14, they tell you the carbon-14 relative to the carbon-12. Carbon-12 is like a stable isotope. It wasn't produced um, by radioactivity. It's not decaying by radioactivity. And, and yet when we make the measurements of radiocarbon, we make them in a mass spectrometer of the 14 to carbon 12 ratio, and we compare them to standards that help us understand how our measurements are, um, you know, how, how precise are our measurements, and how much variation are we putting into the 
um, uh, you know, to the, to the actual value of our sample by the measurement process. So as you can also imagine, if you have a really high value of R in a system, that means it's got a lot of radiogenic daughter. You can get a lot of radiogenic daughter in two ways. If there was a lot of radiogenic parent in a short period of time, and it's just so much parent that it's became really, um, you're seeing a lot of it, or it could be a small amount of parent, but you've waited a really long time. And you can have any scenario in between, but having a high uh, ratio means you've had a high amount of radiogenic ingrowth. So this is a table from, from the reading that basically just shows you some of the elements that people use. It's a periodic chart. And you can ignore um, the things that are in white because we're not gonna talk about them, but the elements that are in this kind of light gray are radioactive parents, right? So I've been talking about the rubidium strontium system already. Rubidium is a parent, so it's listed in gray. Strontium is a daughter. Not all the isotopes of strontium, one isotope, strontium 87, and one isotope, rubidium 87. But so this is a parent daughter pair. Okay. Now, uh, there are some other ones too, um, you know, uh, for instance, osmium. Osmium um, 187 is a radiogenic daughter. It comes from rhenium 187. So these guys are right next to each other too, right? These are parent daughter decays, they're beta decays. We can tell that because if you go back to when we talked about this a few weeks ago, they're only different by one atomic number. We also have, you know, potassium argon dating. That might be another one that you're familiar with. Um, potassium is argon. Okay, potassium 40 decays to argon 40. And, and so that those are other pairs. Now, there's this other category that's shown in pink. It's what I alluded to before. These are things where um, they are intermediate daughters in a chain of radioactivity. We'll talk about them a little bit more next time with a progenitor to uranium and thorium. And they don't just decay to something, they decay to something that decays to something else, to something else, to something else, to something else. The uranium has two main isotopes, 238, 235. They decay through a whole series of steps to ultimately end up at lead. Uranium-238 decays to lead-206, and uranium-238-235 decays to lead-207. Um, Thorium-232 does the same thing it decays through a series of daughters and ends up at lead 208. So a whole bunch of my research going back decades is to look at some of these intermediate daughters, the, the guys that are here in pink, radium, productinium, bismuth, polonium, um, because they have much shorter half-lives than the parents and we can use them to interrogate processes that happen in an active volcano. We won't really have time to talk about that stuff in the classes. It's, is um, a level of complexity that is you know, more than we can do. But what we will talk about is looking at how thorium and uranium decay to lead. We will also talk about rubidium decaying to strontium. Um, we'll talk a little bit about um, what we call lutetium hafnium. Lutetium decaying into hafnium. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about samarium neodymium, which is Samarium decaying to neodymium. Samarium 147 decaying to neodymium 143. That's a bigger decay. That's a four uh, unit decay. So that's an alpha part. And each one of these things are important for different reasons because there's different time scales, different differences in incompatibility between the parent and the daughter, and different assumptions about the early Earth, right? So, like for instance, the rare earth elements, these are awesome. They're refractory. They don't go into the core. They don't go into the atmosphere, we can make the chondritic assumption about our early Earth Samarium neodymium ratios. We can compare what we see in any material on Earth now to what we would predict from a chondritic metal in a really straightforward way. Uranium and thorium are also refractory, so they're good as parents, but lead is complicated, it's volatile, it's siderophile, and it goes into the core. So we don't really know what the lead isotopic composition of the early Earth salt silicate metal was. We have ways of checking it out by like looking for really old lead ores. And that's a way of doing it. Rubidium strontium is the most complicated, right? These are both volatile elements in the condensation sequence. We maybe didn't get a chondritic component in the early mantle. So the way we deduce their isotopic composition for the start is to try and find the oldest meteorites that are the least messed up as possible and look at how rubidium and strontium vary in them and then try and deduce back what the original primitive mantle composition would have been. And those are things, oh yeah. I just had a question. So 
can the okay so for osmeria because yes. you said that the parent was re, re yes, re, yes. okay um but then uh, how come up there can it have more than one parent because like i think up there doesn't it say samarium that's like the parent to... this is just like the legend right so oh, this is just okay. saying that, okay like, so the it's things not... that are in gray are parents so that's a parent that's a parent that's a parent Everything gotcha okay parent. okay okay because i was like wait can they have more than one parent then because i thought that that was like what it was referring there are a couple to. of cases there, there are a few things where you can make the same isotope from two different parents but there are cases where you can make two different daughters from the same parent gotcha. so for okay. instance potassium 40 can decay into both calcium 40 and argon 40 yeah That's like two different pathways okay so that we find but we don't find so much um of the opposite okay okay so this is a table of some of the most common isotope systems that have been used. This type of radiogenic isotope geology kind of initiated in the 60s, like a little bit in the early 50s. But the first systems that were started were uranium lead and then thorium lead and rubidium strontium. And then in the 70s, because it was technically much more difficult to make the measurements, we started to have samarium medium. And then in the 80s, we started to have what we call lutetium halving. And then some of these other systems came online later. And I, the thing I want you to focus on here are these uh, half-lives, right? The lambdas and half-lives are in here. But if you look in this table of half-lives, look at how long all those are, right? Those are all 10 to the 9th is a billion years, right? 10 to the 10th is 10 billion years. Uh, 10 to the 11th is 100 billion years. So you can kind of see here the shortest half-life in this entire list is uranium-235. The stuff that the very first atomic bombs were made of. It's the fastest decaying thing on this list, and a 700 million year half life, right? So if you take like the age of the Earth, about four, four and a half billion years, we've gone through several half lives, whatever that is, something like six half lives. So the amount of uranium 235 has been cut down in a half life that cuts in half, and then it cuts in half again, and half again. So it's cut down pretty substantially. But if you look at uranium 238, its half life is about the same as the age of the Earth. So that means that today on Earth, we've got uh, approximately half as much uranium-238 as we started with. For some of these other dudes, like, you know, with these rage, with these half-lives that are super long, we pretty much still have what we started with because they're decaying so slowly. So for instance, in the case of Samarium-147, where the half-life is 100 billion years, right? The four and a half billion years of Earth's history is just not enough to really see much decay of that. And so um, part of why for this part of you know what we're talking about, we use these really long lived isotopes is because they respond to slow changes um, that happen uh, during Earth history instead of rapid things. They, you can make other tables for the shorter lived isotopes like those intermediates that, that I mentioned are the focus of my research and these decay change, but they, they're not relevant for this discussion that we're having. So th these are the kind of last two slides. Um, this just depicts what the Kind of main systems are the rubidium 87s, uh, the strontium uh, isotope system has rubidium decaying to strontium. Here's the half life. There's a neodymium isotope system that we commonly use, which comes from samarium decaying to neodymium. There's a hafnium system, which comes from lutetium decaying to hafnium. You can see what the half lives are. And I've mentioned one other thing here, which is the relative incompatibility. Rubidium being a large iron lithophile, strontium not. Is it during typical mantle melting? Rubidium is more incompatible. In the case of the samarium neodymium, um, samarium is typically less incompatible. So in one case, the parent is more incompatible than the daughter up here. And in this case, it's the opposite. Um, and um, for lutetium hafnium, which is the progenitor for the hafnium isotope system, is similar to samarium. And we'll see how that, that plays out next time in terms of isotope patterns relative to if we take some mantle and we melt it, what do we get in the uh, melt and what do we get in the remaining mantle? These are the three lead isotope ratios that we use for um, the various, you know, two isotopes of uranium, 238, which is longer lived, and 235. The chemistry of both these things is exactly the same, but the time scale is different. So we can look at when stuff happened by comparing these two ratios in the rocks. And lead 208 comes from thorium. Um, which has an even longer half-life. In all of these cases, the daughter is uh, typically less incompatible than the parent. You can find some examples where it's not quite the case, but um, 
these are the kind of gist of these um, main isotope systems that we commonly use. And so I will pick this discussion up next time. What we're going to do is then talk about sort of how do we know what Earth started with? Like what's our chondritic material or what is our modified chondritic material for some of these isotopes? How do we use them to interrogate the ages of the oldest materials on the planet? And then how do we use them to look at the evolution of isotope reservoirs? We'll do that both times by looking at uh, igneous rocks that are produced from, um, from mantles with you know, different parts of history, different times of formation and different processes. So are there other questions about this? Yeah, so the thing that we're measuring in the last one that you went over is the isotope pair, and that helps us figure out the pair. Yeah, um, you can, so you can do two different things. In some cases, we will measure the parent-daughter ratio and, I mean, the, yeah, we'll measure the parent and the daughter. In some cases, we'll just measure the daughter ratio, as, mm -hmm. as you just mentioned. And um, part of it kind of depends on the conditions in the rock. Some of these elements are really easy to modify by alteration after the fact, and so it's, you don't know, get very reliable measurements. But, um, oh, wow. Um, so yeah, um, we, we measure we measure the daughter ratio um, 